All right, so baby's first phage. This is like this picture. So we're going to be dealing with something where I'm going to kick it off from an independent program. The independent program is going to get the first virus tacked on to some other executable. And then from, ever, from there on, if I run that other executable, that'll invoke the virus code, which will attack it, attach itself to something else. Then when I run that something else, it'll attach itself to something else. And it keeps propagating every time one of these virally infected files is uh, executed. But so I just, like I said, I expand the last section to give me space to tack the virus on there. And then I change the header information to go in there. If I didn't expand that last section, right, my virus would never get mapped into memory. Right? We're back to PE files. You got to have a section to map from file into memory, right? If I just tacked it onto the end of the file, the OS loader would just load up the last section and it would never pull my, my virus code with it. All right, so Bill, we need the camera moved to the screen now. In the life of binaries material, you've got you know, the import address table hooks code. Like I said, this used to be the extent of the labs that I had for this class. I showed you import address table hooking, I showed you the virus, and then there were a couple of hello worlds, that was it. So you've got the, the code here. And I won't run through it first, I'll just show it first, and then we'll kind of talk through this code. Warning, warning, warning. All right. <clears throat> so this virus is neutered in that it will only infect things within SQL and virus target, or at least it will only look for other files within SQL and virus target. So when it's going out, running, and looking for EXEs to infect, it only looks hard-coded SQL and virus target directory just to keep it from spreading outside of here. All right. So what I have to do is I have to kick it off to start with. I'm just going to go ahead and run this thing without, uh, without talking you through it. This initial bootstrap code will look in SQL and virus target, and it will infect the first executable it finds, and then it'll exit. Or it won't. Yeah. All right, run. All right, then it's done. So, all right, I ran the kickoff program. The kickoff program infected the first executable it found. You can see that the size changed from 7K to 11K, right? And now what I'm claiming is that there's the virus code tacked onto the end of this file, and the address of entry point points down to that virus code. So when I invoke hello world, it's going to invoke the virus code. The virus code is going to look in SQL and virus target. It's going to find the first executable. And it's going to find itself as the first executable. And then we use this technique, uh, I think in Veronica's class she called it self-avoidance. You use a technique where you set some little magic value within your thing so that you don't double infect your thing. You don't want to like keep tacking virus code onto the same file, right? So my code, like up in the DOS header, there's some unused value and I just set something in there. So the virus checks, is that magic value set in the DOS header? If so, don't infect it, move on to the next. So that's what stops me from just reinfecting myself over and over again. And that is really hard to see on the screen. Let me see if I can at least bump up the size a little bit. That's going to be the best I can do. So can you guys see that decently right now that the um, that the hello world is 11k whereas it used to be 7k? Is that visible on the uh, video? I think it's not going to be. On the it is now. All right. Cool. Probably have to re-record this part later. That's fine. All right. So now just run hello world. Hello world prints out because it's just hello world. But behind the scenes, hello world infected the next executable, right? Size jumped up. And so now I run hello world again. Infects the next executable. And it'll just continue. I think there's like some self-limiting thing where like hello world will keep infecting executables, but hello world's child will not. So it's like I have like a grandparent, like the grandchild can like 
dies. Basically, it can't infect any more things. Again, just a small rate limiting thing that I threw in there. So the parent is the kickoff program, the child is the hello world, and then the grandchild is the thing which is, you know, this guy that got infected, it cannot infect more things. So if I remember correctly. All right, so that's just showing you the effects. Let's show you the actual code that's implementing this. All right, so we start out with inject me, and we need to go there. Okay, first I got to show you actually uh, just organizationally how this is going to be structured. So Bill, I need to uh, go over to the board briefly. How the virus is going to be structured is that it's going to keep some metadata at the beginning and then it's going to have its code. And this is like lookup kernel 32. This is the main body of the code. And then there's two data fields at the beginning. There's the original entry point. So we keep track of like I changed this binary so that the entry point points down to my virus code. When my virus code is done infecting somebody else, I need to go back up and call the original entry point so that it does hello world or whatever the other original program did, right? So my virus runs first. You know, the entry point came down to here. When my main is done, it's going to do a jump OEP, right? It's just going to take whatever is there and jump back to that so that the original program still runs so that we still see hello world printed out. And then I'll have to check my code, but I believe this next thing is the rate limit in part. The, the rate limit. So each time it does an infection, it increments this rate limit sort of thing. So when this guy writes itself to the next thing, so when this parent writes itself to the child, it does rate limit plus plus. And then somewhere inside this main code, it says if rate limit, you know, two or greater, stop, right? Just jump immediately to OEP. So that's just a little bit of metadata that attacks at the beginning. Um, when the entry point actually is invoked, it's going to call down to this lookup kernel information. This is going to find kernel 32. And once it's found kernel 32, it's going to do the, the load library. Well, actually, so I cheat in this, basically. And that's another reason why this is broken on Windows 7. I cheat. I do imports by ordinals. So I just say, once I found the export address table of kernel 32, I'm just going to pull the RVAs out of index, you know, 50 and 79, 32. Right? I just pull those out. I take the base address of kernel 32, add them, and I treat those as the absolute virtual addresses. The smart, you know, generic way to do it would have been to, you know, find the get proc address and stuff like that, check for the string. But for, for expediency and because I don't particularly care if this is virus code that works well forever, I just took straight out of the export address table functionally importing by ordinal in the virus code. All right. So let's go back to the uh, camera on the screen. There's inject me. This is main, basically. And I think I can do that. Maybe be a little clearer. A little bit. All right. So there's inject me. This is main. And right up above it, there's find kernel 32. Right? And this is that thing that I said is in that shell code paper. This is just a little snippet of assembly that will get you the base address starting by, you know, walking this FS register. That's the thread environment block. And then it goes and finds, you know, the process environment block and blah, blah, blah. It walks its way through and it eventually finds at the very end, it's going to have uh, EAX is going to be equal to the base address of uh, the base address of kernel 32 and EAX is the return register in uh, x86. So basically you call, you know, you're quote calling this function, you're getting the return is the base address of kernel 32. So let's confirm. Yep. Okay. So I didn't quite draw it correct on the board, but my first thing is the kill switch counter, which I called rate limit. And my second thing is the OEP. So those two metadata things are flipped, but it's the same concept. So I just emitted some bytes. So I put four bytes of placeholder data right here. And I put four bytes of placeholder data right here. And so here I'm going to write the original entry point. Here I'm going to do a plus plus on this zero each time I infect the next guy. All right. So the inject me is where the real action happens. 
So the first thing it's going to do, again, this is where it's going to be x86 would help. This is why x86 is a recommended prerequisite for this class. But the first thing it's going to do is this is actually a call instruction, the E8000. It's saying call zero bytes forward. So I'm calling to an address that's zero bytes past the end of the call instruction. So I'm basically calling to the next instruction. The side effect of a call is that you push the address of the next instruction onto the stack. So what I'm really doing is it's like I'm taking the address of the next instruction, pushing it onto the stack. And so this just kind of basically it's used to orient me in memory. This is kind of one of those position independent code tricks. The virus doesn't know where it's going to be loaded in memory. It can't make any assumptions about virtual addresses. It can't trust any relocations to fix it up or anything like that. I mean, it could technically if it went back and hacked the relocations and whatever it, it uh, infects. But for simplicity, we try to go with position independent code. And so therefore, first thing it does is it says, where am I? And this call that pushes the address of the next instruction, you'll have the absolute address of the next instruction put on the stack. And then you just pop it off of the stack into the EAX. And now EAX is the absolute address of specifically this instruction. Then we're doing a sub EAX of hex 40 because right now we're going to be in uh, the main on that picture there. And so we're in main and we are subtracting my current address at the start of main minus 40 because I want to get basically the start address of that metadata that I have up above my code. Right, so current address minus 40 gets me to the metadata. Now I know once I want to copy my virus to the next guy, I know it starts here at the metadata and it'll go, you know, some size down to the end of my virus code. So this is basically just, you know, finding my special data dynamically calculated address. It's EAX after this subtraction. And I just hard coded the 40 in because I just looked at the assembly and said it's 40 bytes backwards to find that metadata. All right. <clears throat> So we've got that and we copy the original entry point. So, and actually, sorry, before that, we say if the zeroth entry is greater than one, that's the rate limit thing. If the rate limit is greater than one, just immediately call the original entry, right? So this is like early exit. If I've already infected too many things, just exit out. All right? Okay, so after that, after we've got into the main, we call the find kernel 32. This gets us back to the find kernel 32 address. So again, I drew that kind of wrong up there. It shouldn't be headers pointing into lookup kernel 32. It is actually headers pointing into main. <clears throat> and then now, once we've got the kernel 32 base address, this is where all of your life of binary knowledge becomes applied, right? So what do we do with that base address? First thing we do is we're going to cast it to a DOS header, right? So this is the data structure pointer to image underscore DOS header. So I'm saying treat this address of the base address of kernel 32 as a DOS header. And so cast it to a DOS header, dereference it, find the ELFA new, right? So what am I going for with this? What data structure am I trying to find the address of? Which data structure is pointed to by ELFA new? It is the last field, but which thing does it point at? Not the entry point of code. Nope, not entry point of code. NT header. NT header. Right, so I'm just finding the, it is the last field of the DOS header, and it tells me what the offset is from the start, which would be the base address, to the NT header. Right, so I'm going to the NT header because I want to get to the export table. All right, so treat all that. This overall gives me the address of the entry, uh, the NT header. And so what do I, well, sorry, it gives me the offset to the entry header. ELFA new is the offset to the entry header. And so I need to take the base address plus the offset to the NT header, and then I'm going to cast that to an image NT header, right? And so now this variable can be treated as if it were the NT header data structure, just a pointer to the NT header data structure. So I've got a pointer to the NT header data structure. What am I going to do with it? Well, way down here at the end, do NT header pointer you reference that to find the optional header, which is embedded within this data structure. Dereference the optional header to get the data directory, right? So that's a, that's a structure again embedded at the end of the optional header. Which index in the data directory do I want? Well, I want the image directory entry exports, right? So I'm going for the export address table. So I go data directory index zero, 
So this is just a constant. Hopefully it'll show when I mouse over it. No. Well, if I right-clicked and went go to definition, it would show me this is defined as zero, just like in that one, slide 46 or whatever. So I go to entry zero, and then I want to get specifically this virtual address field. Right? And that virtual address, that's the RVA into this file in order to find the export information. Right? That first thing that points at three different lists. So I've got the RVA, the offset from the start of kernel 32. So I'm going to need to take the base address of kernel 32, add it to the offset, and now I'll have a pointer to the export information. And there we go. Base address plus that offset that I just had. Right? Base address plus the offset I just calculated equals a pointer to the image export directory. And store that over into this variable, export dir pointer. All right, and now I want the export address table proper, right? This points us at that structure with the time date stamp and the base and the address of functions and the address of names. I want the address of functions field out of that first structure. So got that export dir pointer and just pull out the address of functions. Again, it's an RVA, got to add it to a base. You get the absolute virtual address in memory where the, I'm calling this multi-use in pointer because I'm going to reuse a local variable, but what does this point to at the end of this? It points at the export address table, the array of RVAs. And then from there, I basically cheat. I just pull out, you know, I say index 31 is close handle. Index 4F is create file. Index D9 is find next file. So the virus pulls out all of the file handling functions from kernel 32 that it needs to be able to open C colon virus target, find the first file, find the next files, open the file if it's the file it wants to infect, write to the file if it's the file it wants to infect, right? So it needs these helper functions that just conveniently enough are all in kernel 32. It doesn't have to go look up other DLLs and things like that. They're all in kernel 32. It's the one stop shopping. Even if they weren't all in kernel 32, I could do it easy by finding get proc address and load library out of kernel 32. So once I got those, then I can just hard code strings in and say, I want to look up ntdll.dll. I want to look up gdi plus.dll and all that sort of thing. But anyways, for simplicity and quickness of implementation, I just pulled out all the stuff I needed and used it. So from here, it's, uh, there's not a lot more to go. So we've got all of these file reading things. Now we need to go off and find other binaries to infect, right? So we get all of our different functions we want. And now we have to start using, you know, some, some crazy math to put in strings to create the string for virus target. But all we're really doing is trying to, we didn't have like a string. See, we could have like had a new metadata entry that has the string C colon slash slash virus target and so forth. But again, for simplicity in my world, this is simple, but it's really just it's position independent code. We don't want to have to go find the other data structures and stuff like that. I guess we could have just tacked them on, like I said, but for simplicity, we have this string that we're literally just pushing a chunk of the string onto the stack at a time, four bytes a time of the string going on the stack. And then we just have a pointer to that string that is on the stack. And we pass that pointer into set current directory. And this is why this thing cannot infect outside of C colon virus target because it sets itself into C colon virus target, and then it just looks up local files within whatever the current working directory is, right? So this stuff is not all that interesting. It's just set the current directory to C colon virus target. Then we're going to find first file. This is just, at this point, it just becomes knowing the Windows APIs in order to search for files, just like you were writing any other C code. So find first file, we're just gonna get our parameters and call my find first file that I found manually instead of, you know, import thing. All right, and then I keep trying and I got a loop in order to keep looking for more files. Create file is actually opening a file, a great name. Read file reads the file in. All right, finally, so I've found something that I want to infect, right? And then I read the file in with my special read file. All right, and so the first thing I do, like I said, this is the self-avoidance thing. Well, okay, this is sanity checking actually at this point. First thing I do is I just say, I just read this file buffer in at the beginning of this file buffer, if it's a PE file, it's going to have a DOS header. And if it has a DOS header, so I can just take this buffer worth of data, pretend it's a DOS header, access the eMagic field, which will just be the first two bytes, 
then if that first two bytes is not equal to the signature, which here will just be the 544D or whatever it is, if it's not equal to the MZ, then I'm just going to go on to the next file, right? If it's not MZ, find next file. Keep going, because maybe there's an Excel file sitting in that directory. I don't want to infect the Excel file. So I've got to find a P file with the MZ signature at the beginning. All right? If I pass that signature, the next thing I do is I say treat it as a DOS header, and then there's this E reserved field zero. So E reserved is actually an array in the zero field. It's not used. This is just something randomly I picked, and I said, if this equals hex fool, that means it's already been infected. So when I infect something, I set this field to hex fool, and if I see it already set, I'm not going to reinfect it, right? So this is the first check to say, did I already infect it? If so, find next file. If not, continue on. And so if not, then I go ahead and I start from this point. Now we're going to, you know, pretty much use this thing. We're pretty much guaranteed to use this one last signature check. We're going to, you know, read the buffer information in, check the NT header signature, make sure it's PE. Because here, you know, we could have a, we could have a PE file that has the DOS header but has something else for the NT header. It can happen. There's other things beyond this that use the PE format. So we're checking for the actual PE, and as long, if we don't have that, then we're just going to, uh, you know, close the, the file and call the original entry point. So I guess here I just completely fail out and say, I found a file, I thought I wanted it, read the data, turns out I didn't want it, screw this, I'm done, call the original entry point. All right, but if we get past all of those sanity checks and, you know, self-avoidance and everything else, then we're going to go for this binary. We're going to go ahead and set this binaries within our buffer. We're going to set this, and then we're going to write it back so that we change the DOS header. And then we're going to manipulate. We, we need to go find the section headers, right? So find the NT header plus the size of the NT headers, because we said section headers are immediately after the NT headers. So NT header plus size of NT header, and then now we can assume that's going to be pointing at the... Uh, section headers, and we know how many sections there are and things like that. So this will give us the section header pointer. And then we go look at the characteristics on the last section, and if it's marked as discardable, we're going to go ahead and toggle that flag. We're going to say, I don't want you to throw away from memory this last section OS loader, because I'm going to be embedded in the last section, so I need to stick around so I can run my code. All right, so turn off discardability just in case it's turned on, if it happens to be turned on. And then go ahead and mark that section read, write, execute. So read, write, execute. Right? Because the last section is going to be the dot .reloc or it's going to be the dot .resource. It's not going to be an executable section. So if I try to point my header down there and I try to start executing code in that section, the OS is just going to crash because it was non-executable memory. Or sorry, the OS isn't going to crash. The program's going to crash. Right, so this is just kind of all housekeeping at this point. We gotta fix up flags. We gotta set permissions so that the virus runs. We gotta copy the original entry point out of the image base plus you know optional header address of entry point. So copy the original entry point, the absolute virtual address. So this is a relative virtual address plus the image base that gets us the absolute virtual address. Copy that to the original entry point. And that's actually funny. That probably means it'll break when, if, the, if this thing gets ASLR'd, uh, it'll break because it's using, probably should make that into an RVA, get rid of the image base, but you can do. And then um, finally, increase the size of raw data and increase the virtual size for that last segment, section, so that we've got, you know, our total virus size is less than hex 1000, so we know that hex 1000 should be more than enough extra size in the header information to make sure that our stuff gets mapped into memory with the last section. <clears throat> size of image, got to fix that up. If the size of image is not equal to, you know, the last section virtual address plus the last section virtual size, if your size of image is too small, your data, again, is not going to get mapped into memory and the thing will probably just crash. Do to do, and we said you can fix up the checksum. It actually doesn't matter. The checksum officially doesn't matter. For some reason, I was having weirdness with the virus where it wouldn't run unless I fixed up the checksum, but I don't know why that was. Again, just another nice little breaking thing. But. All right, so then final thing, set file pointer into the uh, file to zero. 
So we want to write back that modified DOS header with the hex pool so that we make sure that this infected thing is marked as infected. And then write back modified headers. And then we're going to do, do, do. Now we need to create the separate bu buffer that's going to hold our virus code. So we already have the pointer sort of to the beginning of our, our metadata and all that stuff. So we're going to take, starting at our metadata, ending at hex 400 times 4, which is more than enough space to hold all of our virus. We're going to copy all of our virus code over to this buffer. And actually, so this is just initializing the buffer. This is copying it into the buffer. It's actually 161 times 4. And then over in that buffer, this is where the plus plus happens. Over in that buffer, I've got my metadata is at the very beginning of that buffer, right? My metadata is the rate limit is the first field of that buffer over to the side. So now I plus plus that buffer, and then I'm going to write that buffer with my metadata and my virus code down to the end of the file that we're infecting. So I put the original entry point there. I put the plus plus on the, uh, I just, I, this would be the rate limiting field. And then finally, I write, I open the file, set the file pointer to the end of the file. So file end, set the file pointer to the file end. And then write the virus buffer out of this buffer to the end of the thing. We write hex 1000 bytes. It'll just be my code plus zeros to the end of the hex 1000 size. And then if that fails, we call the original entry point. Otherwise, we try to clean clean up some stuff. We try to be good citizens and free our handles and all that sort of thing. And then, but finally, this is just something that's used in the bootstrap code. It's not used in the virus. And so then, um, call original entry point. This is just a label at the very end. And we say, all right, go ahead and pull the original entry point for my current executable that's virally infecting someone else and call back up to hello world and let it do its thing. Pull it out, move it into ECX, jump to ECX. Done. Virus has now jumped to the original hello world entry point after having written itself over to some next file. All right. So I think you can see now how there's a lot of P header information that goes into this virus actually being able to really infect the, the other file. There's lots of casting of memory blobs into particular data structures and stuff like that. But, you know, it goes to my point of you can't really understand malware stuff if you're not understanding what manipulations it's doing on these data structures, what does it mean that it, you know, set hex fool into that DOS header? Maybe it has some implications or maybe it's just self-avoidance, right? So the only way you would know it's self-avoidance is you'd go back and you'd say, hey, there's a check. If it's hex fool, call to original entry point. Oh, that's an early exit. Okay, it's a self-avoidance technique. So 